Turn your Bibles to John, the first chapter. And uh, I, I found something interesting here this past week. Um, it, it's called The Four Stages of a Man's Life. Okay? Taking a man. And uh, here, here, here's how it broke it down, just so uh, if this helps any of you men out there uh, today. Uh, the first stage of a man's life is that you believe in Santa Claus. And Dina's talking about Santa Claus. Obviously, when you're smaller, as you grow, then you don't believe in Santa Claus. And then the, the third stage, you open up generally when you end up going into the parenting years, you, you are Santa Claus. You become Santa Claus, you know, when you need to. And then the last stage generally is pretty effective because it kind of covers everything is that you just look like Santa Claus. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what stage you all are in at this point, but whatever it is, embrace it with joy and uh, receive. But listen, I, uh, I'm just going to share just a little bit with you that today. And this being what, what most people call Christmas Sunday. Anytime it's the, it's the Sunday before Christmas Day, it's, it's Christmas Sunday. And this is when probably every pastor, uh, you know, minister across the globe is doing a Christmas message today. Dean and I were talking about this morning, there's only so many, so many variations of the Christmas story. And so, you know, you get up here and you start talking about Christmas and you start about the baby Jesus and the light of the world. And you, it's hard to even come up with a title. That, that's, that's unique anymore because everything has been used over the years. And, 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 you know, sometimes you just have to kind of go back to basics. And really that's kind of what I just wanted to do today was, was take it back to basics. And, and uh, we've got Christmas lights back there. Somebody's got Christmas lights like, shining. Did you, uh, are there little battery power things? Is that like a sword? You know, uh, that's pretty cool. We get enough of those across the, the auditorium with like a Christmas tree in here. That's good. But um, anyhow... I, I got to thinking about this, this story, and I, I wondered, could it be that God is trying to actually teach us through the Christmas story the relevance of, of him being born in us? See, God is a God of oxymorons. An oxymoron, if you're not aware of what that is, most of you are, obviously, it's, it's, it's two terms or like two words that, that are used together that actually seem to contradict each other. And although oxymorons is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible, yet Jesus is the epitome of an oxymoron. Let me show you what I mean. He, he's, he's called the Holy One. He's called the Lord of Glory. You know, Isaiah said that his name would be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, you know, and, and the Prince of Peace. And that the Holy Thing, the Holy One, would be born in such a dirty place a stable in a, in a feeding trough is probably the first glimpse that God isn't afraid to live in you. And as we look at the festivities and the, as we celebrate this season and everything that comes along with this season, understand that, that the wise men, the Bible says, came from afar. What, what that really is just saying is that they came a long, long, long way. Why did they set out on such a long journey is because they knew the significance of the child. I mean, think about this. He was born on Herod's hit list because when the enemy perceives that greatness has the potential of coming forth, he doesn't wait till it comes to full fruition. Oh, no. He goes back to the beginning. He catches it in its embryonic stages, and he tries to cut it off at the pass and to neutralize, thing, neutralize things early. But the thing is, is that no weapon formed against him would prosper. And because of him, no weapon formed against you will prosper. See, that's the hope that we have today. So we have a dirty stable, but we have the Holy One. We have the hit list from hell, but yet we have the giver of life. One who who uh, needed nothing but laid down everything so that we who needed everything might have something. See, don't be fooled by the stable. You can't be fooled by the, by the you know, the, the dirty animals and the feeding trough that would become a makeshift crib. Don't be fooled. He is the king of kings. And 2,000 years later, He's still just as controversial today as he was back then on that night that he stepped into this earth realm in that old stable in Bethlehem. You see, people today, there's some that want to 
just get rid of even the mention of his name in the earth. They want to eradicate the influence of anything that is about Jesus. Yet others still, they want to use it for political gain and for, for influence. And there are those that seek to, to destroy him. There are others that seek to adore him. And yet through it all, he still is. He's undaunted by public opinion. He's unmoved by what people say. He's unchanged by the status quo. He's not moved by the traditions of men. He just is. He is exactly who he told Moses that he would be. Last week, Dina talked about Moses meeting God at the burning bush that, didn't, that wasn't consumed. And it was there that God told Moses to go and save my people or set my people free. Moses asked the question, who shall I say sent me? You know the answer. God said, just tell them I am. Not I want to be, not I could be, not who do you want me to be, just I flat out am. That's just who I am. I'll be whatever you need me to be in the times that you need me to be it. And in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Do you hear that? That he is. We've got that verse. We've got Hebrews, uh, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not just when you're having a bad day. Not just when things get so insurmountable that you don't have a clue what you're going to do. Not just when, you know, not just when somebody did you wrong. The fact is, is it's talking about diligence. Diligence has to do with, with targeted, focus, intentionality, pursuit, consistency. And that's, that's exactly what the wise men 2,000 years ago displayed in their journey when they set out to go and to find the Christ child. Obviously, you know this. It, all the nativity scenes uh, show the wise men in there, but they weren't there. It was about actually about two years later that they showed up when Jesus was two years old. But there was something that moved them. There was something that set them, and they focused, and they targeted, and they, they mapped this thing out, and they, they went until they found him. That's what wise men do. Wise men still seek him today. Do you? You know, people talk about, okay, well, you say he's a rewarder. Well, what, what kind of rewards are there for me? Is it just that I get to go to heaven? Is it that he just protects my family? Is it, is it that he provides for me when I need things? Is it that, you know, he heals me when I'm sick? Because if believers were honest, most believers, people have prayed for all of those things and have not seen a lot of those things happen the way that they've prayed and they've hoped for. But here's something I need you to know, that you will never reap the benefits of something that you have no knowledge of. You never will. You can hold it in your hand. You can possess it in your, on your person or in your life. But if you have no knowledge of it, the potential or the power of it means nothing to you. And the thing is, I, I, I remember my, my grandson, Cohen, who, who's now nine, but when he was eight years old, about a year ago, he was over at the house, and he's, he's got this uh, uh, the electronic game. It's a Switch. I think a Nintendo Switch is what, what it is, and you can you know, put different games in, and like Super Mario Brothers and Minecraft and these different things like that. And we make sure that he, it's, not, it's not the violent you know, type of games, but these are more just the fun things. You can try to jump over this and get that, and you, know, you get points. You know how the thing goes, most of you. Most of you who are under, <clears throat> under 10 know, but there's nobody in here 10. So the fact is this, is he said, Grandpa, I said, do you want to you play me? You wanna, let, let's play together. And I'm thinking, well, well, sure, this is good bonding time for Grandpa. And, and I like to win. So I, I just, I figured, I figured, you need to show me how to play this game. Now show me what the buttons do. And he's got this, this little thing about this big, and it's got, you know, you all have seen them probably. You've got just different buttons. And then you, you can actually press another button over here. And the same buttons over here do something else. So you need to know what they do in order to do it. So I said, well, show me how this works. And so he goes through it real quick. I said, he's, you know, he's not a very good teacher. But the fact is, is I, I was trying to learn really fast because I didn't want him to wipe me out. And the thing is this, is he killed me. And he was a punk because he rubbed it in my face. 
And the thing is I discovered off of that whole thing is I held in my hand the potential, I held the power to absolutely annihilate him. But I did not have the knowledge of what I held in my hand. So it meant nothing. It was as if I had nothing. The thing is, is you will never fully benefit from that which you don't have knowledge of. And I've shared this with you all in the past. And maybe some of you who are new have never heard this before. But especially in the New Testament, the word light means knowledge. The word darkness means ignorance. Or in other words, the lack of of knowledge and understand that Satan has power in darkness his power is not in light his power is in darkness according to Jude 1 6 that Satan and his demonic realm are in everlasting chains under darkness in other words God said Satan the realm that you have the right to traffic in is in darkness in other words in what you don't know that's why we must always be increasing in the knowledge of God because that's what pushes the devil back. Wherever I am learning and I am gaining knowledge of truth or of who God is, then I am pushing the enemy and his influence out of my life. Why do you think we stress the Bible? It's not just because we're in church and that's what we're supposed to do. This is, this is absolutely necessary for us to be able to walk in the authority and the abundant blessing that God has for us and has purpose for each one of us. Now, over in John, the first chapter, look there. I know Dina read this last week, and uh, I, I just want to read, read it again and take it from a different angle here. In John 1, we've, we've heard this verse, and we've read it probably, if you've been in church for any length of time, you've probably read it a, a number of times. But it says, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, think about that for a moment. He said, in the beginning was the word. The word, word, the, the, the Greek word for word there is logos. Now, when we think of logos, we think of, of the red word or the, the written word. But that's not its fullest translation and meaning in this passage of Scripture right here. It actually means the truest translation, logos, in the Greek means an expressed idea. So think about that for a moment. If we reread that passage using that translation, it would read like this. In the beginning was the expressed idea, and the expressed idea was with God, and the expressed idea was God. And this expressed idea was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through this expressed idea. And without the expressed idea... Nothing was made that was made. And in this expressed idea was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In the beginning was God's idea. The idea was with God. The idea was God. The idea became Light, or in other words, the knowledge of men. The word knowledge means a transfer of idea. In other words, God who knows all things, and he sent his only begotten son to the earth to be the transfer of himself to man. See, that's why Jesus said over in, in John the 8th chapter, 12th verse, he said, he said, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now think about that. He said, I, I'm the light. I'm, I'm the transfer of idea. I'm of knowledge into the earth. 
And whoever follows me, you got to remember something, is Satan can never rule where you follow him. He said, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, in ignorance, but shall have the light, the knowledge of life. So that sermon that you refuse to heed, the Bible that you won't pick up and read, the godly counsel that you choose not to receive, the discipleship opportunities that you just let pass by, wherever you are not learning and growing, whatever area you choose not to grow in the knowledge of God, that's where the enemy can traffic your life. In what you don't know. Are you following me? He's the prince of darkness. The ruler of darkness. A prince is a ruler. Darkness is ignorance. So in other words, he's the ruler over that which you're ignorant of. That which you do not know. So listen, we have it right here. It's here for the taking but we have to diligently seek him. That, that's, why, that's why the Bible says in 2 Peter 1.3, it says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, catch this, through the what? Through the knowledge, the transfer of idea of him who called us by glory and virtue. The fact is, church, is that Jesus came to show you who you really are. See, you came out of God, predestined before the foundations of the world. And God, who knows all things, had plans for you before you were ever, ever conceived. Why in the world would you not seek to know him? Jeremiah 29, he, he, he said that, seek me, and you will find me if, and here's a contingency, if you search for me with all of your heart, really that ties back over into Hebrews eleven six, 6, where it talks about diligently seeking him. Because when you seek with, with your whole heart, your whole life, how many of you ever lost your keys, you know, and, and you're, you're getting ready to go out the the door to work, and you've been late 14 times, and this time they're going to fire you if you're not. And, and you know how it is? You, 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 get, you, get, you get stressed out, and you are, you, you're not just casually walking through the house. Hmm, I wonder where my keys are. Oh, no. No, you are tearing seat cushions and couches and lifting up the bed and getting everybody, everybody, look for my keys. Look in the closet. Look in, I mean, I mean it's, it's, a, it's a focused, targeted pursuit. In other words, you're looking with your whole heart. It's just not casual. Those who seek him, if you, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. It's got to be something that just can't be haphazard. It just can't be a casual flow of, you know, just going through life. And, you know, uh, whenever I need help, I'll just go to God and see if he'll help me. And he's never really helped me before. Haven't really ever seen it come about. I haven't seen my prayers answered like I prayed. But we still go because we're kind of hoping deep down inside that maybe this time will be different. The fact is this is we don't have, we don't, we're not even, we're not even applying the proper application because we don't have knowledge of what it is we have. So when you pursue that way though, when you pursue him, when you are intent and you are diligent like the Bible says, then your mind is transformed out of the perception of the world into the mind of Christ. That's what the whole renewing process is that Paul talked about in in Romans 12, when you be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. In the, the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this is, this is the first time that Jesus is delivering a message to the multitudes. And we, we know Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is what, is what uh, most people know it as the Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting because what Jesus is doing right out of the gate is he, is he is attacking their darkness. He's attacking their ignorance. And, and check this out. He says things like this. He comes and he says, 
You have heard that it hath been said by them of old, not to commit murder. Because if you commit murder, you will be in danger of judgment. But he said, then I, but I say to you, that if you're even angry with your brother, you're going to be in danger of judgment. Now, look at what he just did. He, is, he took something that had already been established, a, a mindset, a belief system that had been set up by man. It's what we would call law. And here comes Jesus. This is New Testament now that he's in. So now we're talking about a, a new covenant. And now we're, now we're talking about the, the real introduction of, of grace and the grace empowerment of God. And what you need to understand, that the righteousness of grace always exceeds the righteousness of the law. So what, what happened under the law is you actually had to do the act. You had to commit murder. But under grace, you just have to be angry. And the same, the same punishment or the same judgment comes back to you. He went on to say, hey, you've heard that it had been said by them of old not to commit adultery. But I say to you, that if a man even looks at a woman to lust after her, he's already committed adultery in his heart. So under the law, you actually had to commit adultery. Under grace, you just got to think it. See, the righteousness of grace always exceeds the righteousness of the law. People talk about that when it comes to giving. Well, we're not under law. Well, we don't have to, we don't have to tithe anymore, or we don't have to give to God. And, you know, the tenth, that was us only under law. Well, wait a second. If, if the righteousness of grace exceeds the righteousness of the law, then, then a tenth is only the beginning under grace. You understand? Jesus went on to say things like this. He said, listen, you've heard that it hath been said by them of old to love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, listen to this, I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for them who despitefully use you. What was Jesus doing? He was speaking into their ignorance. He was speaking into their darkness. He was speaking into their belief system. In other words, he was saying, this is your idea on the matter, but let me give you the Father's idea on the matter. He came to bring a transfer of idea. He was the living expression he was the light people want to drive darkness out of their life and out of areas of their life all of the time but let me tell you something just coming to church or tuning in once or twice a month is not going to do it it's not going to be even the fact that you serve in areas and the usher or greeter you know or you know you're serving in in, in children's and you know once a month or you're just doing good things i mean we appreciate that and the fact is is that should be a part a natural part of the believer's life is just serving. But that by itself will not cast or get rid of darkness out of your life. The only way that darkness is dispelled is when the light comes on. When the idea is revealed. Revealed. Revelation. See, that's why you have to hold on. To these ideas that's why that's why it can't be something that comes in our our mind or our heart today and then tomorrow it's gone you know what you know what James 121 says he said is it is the implanted word in other words the rooted established word that is able to save your soul in other words it is the word that sticks you can listen to me for 35, 40 minutes on a Sunday. But how much of it sticks? Because that's, that's all, the only thing that's going to help you is what sticks. Abraham, Abraham held on to a word for 28 years. <laughs> 20 years. In the natural seemed impossible. It was, he was going to be a father of nations. He, was gonna, he, he, was gonna, he and his wife Sarah was going to have a son. You know, and she's past her childbearing years. And you think about all the, the natural things that make it impossible to think about, but yet, yet God said it, so Abraham held on to it, no matter how crazy it seemed in the natural. You know, when you look at the Christmas story, <laughs> and you, 
you look at the angel that came to Mary. She said, Mary, you're going to become pregnant by a spirit. Explain that one to your fiancé. You know? No, really, hon. You can't see it. I don't know. It's just, I don't know how it's going to happen. You know, just going to, you know, I mean, this is God. And, you know, I, can you imagine trying to explain that whole thing? But think, I mean, no woman on the earth had, had ever conceived a child without knowing a man intimately. So what was the angel doing? The angel transferred a new idea into the earth. Later in scripture, it says that Mary, that she kept these things and she pondered them in her heart. <laughs> I'll bet there was a lot of pondering that went on with Mary in the months and the, the years following that original encounter with the angel. But this, from the time that Jesus, Yeshua, was born to the time that he willingly lay down his life I am convinced that it was revealed many times over many many times over the impact of Mary's willing heart to be a conduit of God's idea of God's light into the earth and the same way that that was given to Mary that's being given to us here today. We are, as believers, as sons of God, we're called to be light. Jesus himself said, you are the light of the world. That, that means that you are the, the expressed idea of heaven in earth. You, you are the ones who are to bring the transfer. In other words, I'm, I'm going to give it to you, and then you distribute it to them. The same way that, that, you know, God impregnates Mary supernaturally and she, in a sense, distributed redemption through the Son of God for all mankind forever and ever. But she had to be willing and she had to be obedient and she had to hold on to the Word. She hit, she did, she pondered it, she held on to it. There was going to be something that more that was going to come out of this than just a baby because, because the way it was happening she and Joseph were humiliated and, and probably embarrassed and had to answer a lot of questions to people and were probably cast out. But through it all, they were willing to say yes. And they became the conduit to bring that expressed idea into the world. See, that's why Jesus, that's why Jesus said, and you know, again in, in John 8, 12, he said, I, I'm the light. I'm, I'm the I'm the expressed idea of heaven to the world. And he who follows me, in other words, follow. It's not just he who knows about me. It's just not he who read about me and he who, you know, says that he says that he follows me. But it's he who follows me. There, there's got to be an actual act of obedience in there. You know, it's like Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't even do the things that I say? It, 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 will always, it will always come down to an act of obedience, of actually carrying it out. Not just thinking about it, but taking from the thinking to the doing. He said, those who follow me shall not walk in darkness, will not walk in ignorance, will not walk being blinded by things. Because their minds will not be set on things of the earth. They'll be set and established on things above where Christ is. Because it's there. It's there that we are directed. That's, that's what happens inside of us. Then that bears out and manifests in the natural. As a man thinketh, so is he. It's going to start. It's going to start in the mind. It's going to start in that soulish realm. It's going to start right there because the spirit is crying out and saying, come. Come, I, you are the light. You are the salt. I've already given you that authority. I've already given you that mandate. Now, will you just step up and follow me? Will you obey? Will you become a conduit? Will you be the one who's willing to stand up? And even when it sounds crazy to everybody else out there, will you say, just like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, take me. 
will you? Because if you follow him, you'll never walk in darkness, but you will have the light, the knowledge of life and life everlasting because that's what he came to give you. He came to give you life, the Bible says, to the fullest, abundantly. But are you willing to follow him? Will you bow your heads? Father, I pray that you will allow the, God, you'll allow the very, I don't know, base principle of this message today. Lord Jesus, that you'll allow it to saturate our hearts once again. I pray that we not get so used to this Christmas story and that we get so used to the Christmas mindset and everything that we've heard for years that, Father, we're, we're missing the fresh new things that you're speaking to us. God, I pray for divine revelation oh, to be exposed and to be manifested in our lives. May this be a different Christmas than we've ever experienced before. God, that it's not just about a baby in a manger, but it's about, it's about an, an idea, an expressed idea being delivered and distributed into a world to bring about change that will only come through the willing hearts of people who will follow him. So, Father, I pray that over this people here today. I pray that we won't be slack concerning your promises. God, that we won't, we won't be casual in our, in our perspective, in our mindsets, in our relationship with you. But, Lord, I pray, that, I pray that that word diligence will take prominence in our life. I pray that that searching with all of our heart will be the very thing that drives us. And, Lord, that we will, from there, that we will experience a greater understanding and a revelation and a knowledge of who you are and who we are through you. Lord, let it be established this day, this day, right now. And I don't know if there's anybody in this house and those watching online right now who have never yet made a decision to follow Christ. You can't follow him physically without following him first with your heart. The fact is this, you can't just go through motions. No, this is a giving of everything that you are. He laid down everything for you. And so what he does is he asks us that you lay down everything for him. I mean, what, what a lopsided exchange that the God who spoke the world into existence, you know, the, 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 the one who loves us with an everlasting love that can never change, the one, who, the one who gives us the authority and the power to overcome by his grace, the one who establishes us in, 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 as we are uh, founded and grounded in his word, that that word begins to come alive and come out of our lives. And we become doers of the word and not just hearers only. The one who empowers us to, to go further and, and, and farther than we ever could anticipate or think that we could do in ourselves. The one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Why? Why would we think in any way possible that it's an even equal exchange? Me laying my life down and taking up his resurrected life, there, there is no comparison. And I don't know why anybody would ever, ever shun that opportunity and ever turn away. If you're in this house today and you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you ever said, Jesus, come into my heart, man, I give my life to you, I lay myself down, and Lord, I pick up your life, and I pray that you will take and bring your resurrection life and power, and that your spirit will lead me. That maybe this might be the first Christmas that will be a significant mark difference than any other year that you've ever experienced in your life. Why? because you made a decision to follow him. If you're in this house today or you're watching online right now, if you're in-house and you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want to receive Christ into my heart. Will you slip your hand up right now? Just wave it to me so that I can see it in here. Anybody in the house at all? Okay, just wave it and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to accept Christ into my heart. Maybe you're watching online right now and I don't know where you're at or what state you're in, what time zone it is. The fact is this is right now. 
wherever you are. Man, there, there is nothing about geographics that has to do with God touching your heart. He's there with you right now. And His arms are open wide to receive you. And if you are wanting to make Jesus the Lord of your life today, let me tell you something. You can do that right now. Right now. There's a number at the bottom of the screen on, on whatever platform you are watching. You can call that number. Somebody will walk you through and talk you through and, 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 and help you to take the step through. But even right now, even as we are talking and I'm sharing with you in this moment, if you will just cry out to the Lord. The Bible says all who cry or call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's just a matter of saying, Jesus, I let myself go and I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. You're crying out. You're giving your all to him because he laid his all down for you. You can do that right now. And if you are doing that and you are saying that and you're making that decision, I want you to call that number in the screen. Let somebody know the decision that you're making right now. Maybe you just need to press a button online and chat with somebody that we got people and a team who are ready to respond to you but i want you to know if you made that decision today it's the greatest decision that you'll ever ever make in your life and this will be this will be a different christmas experience than you've ever experienced before because now you're not just reading out of a book a, a story about a baby now the christ child has become alive to you through the person of Jesus Christ and His Spirit now has impregnated your spirit with the living life of Jesus Christ. And you are transformed. You are changed. You have been regenerated in your spirit. That part that was dead has now come alive unto Christ. And you are a new creature, a new creation in Christ.